Section 4 of The Rider on the White Horse by Theodor Storm Translated by Margarete Münsterberg This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2013 In the January of Hauke's third year of service, a winter festival was to be held. Eisboseln, they call it here. The winds had been calm on the coast, and steady frost had covered all the ditches between the fens with a solid, even, crystal surface, so that the marked-off strips of land offered a wide field for the throwing at a goal of little wooden balls filled with lead. Day in, day out, a light northeast wind was blowing. Everything had been prepared. The people from the higher land, inhabitants of the village that lay eastward above the marshes, who had won last year, had been challenged to a match and had accepted. From either side, nine players had been picked. The umpire and the scorekeepers had been chosen. The latter, who had to discuss a doubtful throw whenever a difference of opinion came up, were always chosen from among people who knew how to place their own case in the best possible light, preferably young fellows who not only had good common sense, but also a ready tongue. Among these was, above all, Ole Peters, the headman of the dikemaster. Throw away like devils, he said. I'll do the talking for nothing. Toward evening on the day before the holiday, a number of throwers had appeared in the side room of the parish inn up on the higher land, in order to decide about accepting some men who had applied in the last moment. Hauke Haien was among these. At first he had not wanted to take part, although he was well aware of having arms skilled in throwing, but he was afraid that he might be rejected by Ole Peters, who had a post of honour in the game, and he wanted to spare himself this defeat. But Elke had made him change his mind at the eleventh hour. "'He won't dare, Hauke,' she had said. "'He is the son of a day labourer. Your father has his cow and horse, and is the cleverest man in the village.' "'But if he should manage to after all?' Half smiling, she looked at him with her dark eyes. Then he'll get left, she said, in the evening when he wants to dance with his master's daughter. Then Hauke had nodded to her with spirit. Now the young man who still hoped to be taken into the game stood shivering and stamping outside the parish inn and looked up at the top of the stone church tower which stood beside the tavern. The pastor's pigeons, which during the summer found their food on the fields of the village, were just returning from the farmyards and barns of the peasants, where they had pecked their grain, and were disappearing into their nests underneath the shingles of the tower. In the west, over the sea, there was a glowing sunset. "'We'll have good weather tomorrow,' said one of the young fellows, and began to wander up and down excitedly. "'But cold, cold!' Another man, when he saw no more pigeons flying, walked into the house and stood listening beside the door of the room, in which a lively babble was now sounding. The second man of the dikemaster, too, had stepped up beside him. "'Listen, Hauke,' he said to the latter, "'now they are making all this noise about you.' And clearly one could hear from inside Ole Peter's grating voice, "'Underlings and boys don't belong here.' "'Come!' whispered the other man, and tried to pull Hauke by his sleeve to the door of the room. Here you can learn how high they value you. But Hauke tore himself away and went to the front of the house again. They haven't barred us out so that we should hear, he called back. Before the house stood the third of the applicants. I'm afraid there's a hitch in this business for me, he called to Hauke. I'm barely eighteen years old, if they only won't ask for my birth certificate. Your headman, Hauke, will get you out of your fix, all right. Yes, out, growled Hauke and kicked a stone across the road, but not in. The noise in the room was growing louder, then gradually there was calm. Those outside could again hear the gentle northeast wind that broke against the point of the church steeple. The man who listened joined them. Whom did they take in there? asked the eighteen-year-old one. Him, said the other, and pointed to Hauke. 
Ole Peters wanted to make him out as a boy, but the others shouted against it, and his father has cattle and land, said Yes Hansen. Yes, land, cried Ole Peters, land that one can cart away on thirteen wheelbarrows. Last came Ole Hansen. Keep still, he cried. I'll make things clear. Tell me, who is the first man in the village? Then all kept mum and seemed to be thinking. Then a voice said, I should say it was the dikemaster. And who is the dikemaster? cried Ole Hansen again, but now think twice. Then somebody began to laugh quietly, and then someone else too, and so on till there was nothing but loud laughter in the room. Well, then call him, said Ole Hansen. You don't want to keep the dikemaster out in the cold. I believe they're still laughing, but Ole Peter's voice could not be heard any more. Thus the young fellow ended his account. Almost in the same instant the door of the room inside the house was opened suddenly, and out into the cold night sounded loud and merry cries of Hauke, Hauke Haien. Then Hauke marched into the house and never could hear the rest of the story of who was the dikemaster. Meanwhile no one has found out what was going on in his head. After a while, when he approached the house of his employers, he saw Elke standing by the fence below, where the ascent began. The moonlight was shimmering over the measureless white frosted pasture. "'You are standing here, Elke?' he asked. She only nodded. "'What happened?' she said. "'Has he dared?' "'What wouldn't he?' "'Well, and?' "'Yes, Elke, I'm allowed to try it tomorrow.' Good night, Hauke, and she fled up the slope and vanished into the house. Slowly he followed her. Next afternoon on the wide pasture that extended in the east along the land side of the dike, one could see a dark crowd. Now it would stand motionless, now move gradually on, down from the long and low houses lying behind it, as soon as a wooden ball had twice shot forth from it over the ground, now freed by the bright sun from frost. The teams of the Eisbosler were in the middle, surrounded by young and old, by all who lived with them in these houses or up in those of the higher land, the older men in long coats, pensively smoking their short pipes, the women in shawls or jackets, some leading children by the hand or carrying them on their arms. From the frozen ditches, which were being crossed gradually, the pale light of the afternoon sun was gleaming through the sharp points of the sedges. It was keen frost, but the game went on uninterruptedly, and the eyes of all were again and again following the flying ball, for upon it depended the honour of the whole village for the day. The score-keepers of the two sides carried a white stick with an iron point for the home team, a black one of the same kind for the team of the people from the upper land. When the ball ended its flight, the stick was driven into the frozen ground, accompanied, as it happened, either by silent approval or the derisive laughter of the opposing side, and he whose ball had first reached the goal had won the game for his team. Little was said by all these people, only when a capital throw had been made, a cry from the young men or women could be heard. Sometimes, too, one of the old men would take his pipe out of his mouth and knock with it on the shoulder of the thrower with a few cheering words. That was a good throw, said Zacharias, and threw his wife out of the door. Or, that's the way your father threw, too, God bless him in eternity, or some other friendly saying. Hauke had no luck with his first throw. Just as he was swinging his arm backward in order to hurl off the ball, a cloud sailed away which had covered the sun, so that now its bright beams shut into his eyes. The throw was too short, the ball fell on a ditch and remained stuck in the ice. "'That doesn't count! That doesn't count! Hauke, once more!' called his partners. But the score-keeper of the people from the high land protested against this. "'It'll have to count. A throw is a throw.' Ole, Ole Peters, cried the young folks of the marshes. Where is Ole? Where the devil is he? But there he was. Don't scream so. Does Hauke have to be patched up somewhere? Oh, I thought as much. Never mind, Hauke has to throw again. Now show that your tongue is good for something. 
Oh, it is all right, cried Ole and stepped up to the scorekeeper of the other side and talked a lot of bosh. But the pointedness and sharpness of his usually so scintillating words were absent this time. Beside him stood the girl with the enigmatic eyebrows and looked at him sharply with angry glances, but she was not allowed to talk, for women had no say in the game. "'You are babbling nonsense,' cried the other scorekeeper, "'because you can't use any sense for this. Sun, moon, and stars are alike for us all and always in the sky. The throw was awkward, and all awkward throws have to count.' Thus they talked back and forth a little while, but the end of it was that, according to the decision of the umpire, Hauke was not allowed to repeat his throw. "'Come on!' called the people from the upper land, and their scorekeeper pulled the black stick out of the ground, and the thrower came forward when his number was called and hurled the ball ahead. When the headman of the dikemaster wanted to watch the throw, he had to pass Elke Volkert's. "'For whose sake have you left your brains at home today?' she whispered to him. Then he looked at her almost grimly, and all joking was gone from his broad face. "'For your sake,' he said, "'for you have forgotten yours too.' "'Go, go, I know you, Ole Peters,' the girl replied, drawing herself up straight. But he turned his head away and pretended not to have heard." And the game and the black and white stick went on. When Hauke's turn to throw came again, his ball flew so far that the goal, the great whitewashed barrel, came clearly in sight. He was now a solidly built young fellow, and mathematics and the art of throwing he had practiced daily in his boyhood. "'Why, Hauke!' there were cries from the crowd. "'That was just as if the archangel Michael himself had thrown the ball.' An old woman with cake and brandy pushed her way through the crowd toward him. She poured out a glass for him and offered it to him. Come, she said, we want to be friends. This today is better than when you killed my cat. When he looked at her, he recognized her as Trin Jans. Thank you, old lady, he said, but I don't drink that. He put his hand into his pocket and pressed a newly minted mark piece into her hand. Take that and empty your glass yourself, Trin, and so we are friends. You're right, Hauke, replied the old woman while she obeyed his instructions. You're right, that's better for an old woman like me. How are your ducks getting on? He called after her when she had already started on her way with her basket, but she only shook her head without turning round and struck the air with her old hands. Nothing, nothing, Hauke, there are too many rats in your ditches. God help me, but I've got to support myself some other way. And so she pushed her way into the crowd and again offered her brandy and honey cake. The sun had at last gone down behind the dike. In his stead rose a red-violet glimmer. Now and then black crows flew by and for moments looked gilded. Evening had come. But on the fence the dark mass of people were moving still farther away from the already distant houses toward the barrel, an especially good throw would have to reach it now. The people of the marshes were having their turn. Hauke was to throw. The chalky barrel showed white against the broad evening shadow that now fell from the dine, for it was very close. They had the advantage of at least ten feet. Hauke's lean figure was just stepping out of the crowd. The grey eyes in his long Frisian face were looking ahead at the barrel, in his hand, which hung down, he held the ball. "'I suppose the bird is too big for you,' he heard Ole Peter's grating voice in this instant behind his ears. "'Shall we exchange it for a grey pot?' Hauke turned round and looked at him with steady eyes. "'I'm throwing for the marshes,' he said. "'Where do you belong?' "'I think I belong there, too. I suppose you're throwing for Elke Volkert's. "'Go!' shouted Hauke and stood in position again. But Ole pushed his head still nearer to him. Then suddenly, before Hauke could do anything against it himself, a hand clutched the intruder and pulled him back, so that the fellow reeled against his comrades. It was not a large hand that had done it, for when Hauke turned his head round for a moment, he saw Elke Volkerts putting her sleeve to rights, and her dark brows looked angry in her heated face. 
Now something like steely strength shot into Hauke's arm. He bent forward a little, rocked the ball a few times in his hand, then he made the throw, and there was dead silence on both sides. All eyes followed the flying ball, one could hear it whiz as it cut the air. Suddenly, already far from the starting point, it was covered by the wings of a silver gull that came flying from the dike with a scream. At the same time, however, one could hear something bang from a distance against a barrel. "'Hurrah for Hauke!' cried the people from the marshes, and cries went through the crowd, "'Hauke! Hauke Haien has won the game!' He, however, when all were crowding round him, had thrust his hand to one side to seize another, and even when they called again, "'Why are you still standing there, Hauke? The ball is in the barrel!' He only nodded and did not budge from his place. Only when he felt that the little hand lay fast in his, he said, "'You may be right. I think myself I have won.' Then the whole company streamed back, and Elke and Hauke were separated and pushed on by the crowd along the road to the inn, which ascended from the hill of the dikemaster to the upper land. At this point both escaped the crowd, and while Elke went up to her room, Hauke stood in front of the stable door on the hill, and saw how the dark mass of people was gradually wandering up to the parish tavern, where a hall was ready for the dancers. Darkness was slowly spreading over the wide land. It was growing calmer and calmer round about. Only in the stable behind him the cattle were stirring. From up on the high land he believed that he could already hear the piping of the clarinets in the tavern. Then round the corner of the house he heard the rustling of a dress, and with small steady steps someone was walking along the path that led through the fens up to the high land. Now he discerned the figure walking along in the twilight, and saw that it was Elke. She, too, was going to the dance at the inn. The blood shot up to his neck. Shouldn't he run after her and go with her? But Hauke was no hero with women. Pondering over this problem, he remained standing still until she had vanished from his sight in the dark. Then, when the danger of catching up with her was over, he walked along the same way until he had reached the inn by the church, where the chattering and shouting of the crowds in front of the house and in the hall, and the shrill sounds of the violins and clarinets surged round him and bewildered his senses. Unobserved he made his way into the guild hall, but it was not large and so crowded that he could not look a step ahead of him. Silently he stood by the doorpost and looked into the restless swarm. These people seemed to him like fools. He did not have to worry that anyone was still thinking of the match of this afternoon and about who had won the game only an hour ago. Everybody thought only of his girl and spun round with her in a circle. His eyes sought only the one, and at last, there. She was dancing with her cousin, the young dyke overseer, but soon he saw her no longer, only other girls from the marshes or the high land who did not concern him. Then suddenly the violins and clarinets broke off, and the dance was over, but immediately another one began. An idea shot through Hauke's head. He wondered if Elke would keep her word, and if she would not dance by him with all the peters. He had almost uttered a scream at this thought, then, yes, what should he do then? But she did not seem to be joining in this dance, and at last it was over. Another one followed, however, a two-step, which had just come into vogue here. The music started up madly, the young fellows rushed to their girls, the lights flickered along the walls. Hauke strained his neck to recognize the dancers, and there, in the third couple, was Ole Peters. But who was his partner? A broad fellow from the marshes stood in front of her and covered her face. But the dance was raging on, and Ole and his partner were turning out of the crowd. For Lina, for Lina Harders, cried Hauke almost aloud and drew a sigh of relief. But where was Elke? Did she have no partner, or had she rejected all because she did not want to dance with Ole? And the music broke off again, and a new dance began, but she was not in sight. There came Ole, still with fat Volina in his arms. Well, well, said Hauke, yes, Harders with his twenty-five acres will soon have to retire too. 
But where is Elke? He left the doorpost and crowded farther into the hall. Suddenly he was standing in front of her, as she sat with an older girlfriend in a corner. Hauke, she called, looking up to him with her narrow face. Are you here? I didn't see you dance. I didn't dance, he replied. Why not, Hauke? And half rising, she added, Do you want to dance with me? I didn't let Ole Peters do it. He won't come again. But Hauke made no move in this direction. Thank you, Elke, he said. I don't know how to dance well enough. They might laugh at you, and then... He stopped short and looked at her with his whole heart in his grey eyes, as if he had to leave it to them to say the rest. What do you mean, Hauke? she said in a low voice. I mean, Elke, the day can't turn out any better for me than it has done already. Yes, she said, you have won the game. Elke, he reproached her almost inaudibly. Then her face flushed crimson. Go, she said, what do you want? And she cast down her eyes. But when Elke's friend was being drawn away to the dance by a young man, Hauke said louder, I thought, Elke, I had won something better. A few seconds longer her eyes searched the floor, then she raised them slowly, and a glance met his so full of the quiet power of her nature that it streamed through him like summer air. Do as your heart tells you to, Hauke, she said. We ought to know each other. Elke did not dance any more that evening, and then, when both went home, they walked hand in hand. Stars were gleaming in the sky above the silent marshes. A light east wind was blowing and bringing severe cold with it, but the two walked on, without many shawls or coverings, as if it had suddenly turned spring. End of section 4